Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good day to you all, wherever you may happen to be in the world. Um, I'm Tad, I haven't been here for a while. I'm sure that uh, everybody has forgotten me, and that's okay. I'm willing to start all over again. Um, but in the interim, while I'm doing that, um, I'm going to just kind of go ahead and do all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, because I really don't know how to do anything else except talk and write. So that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, good to see you all and a uh, pleasure to have you back with me. Um, I am going to try my best here. Let me move this over here. Okay, um, that way I'm less likely to accidentally hit the wrong button because um, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, so we've got various folks showing up. Yes, good, good, all good so far. And um, I will bring you back up to date. What is there to bring you back up to date on? Life is totally psychotic as usual. Um, running around, doing lots of things, most of which are of no interest to anybody except me. So I will uh, just kind of skip over most of them. Uh, the the draft that I was working on when we were all last together of Navigator's Children is now finished and sent off. Um, it's with my publisher. I will have still more uh, revision to do, uh, another draft at least, and uh, some more polishing before the book is ready. But basically, I'm finished with it. Um, I'm hoping I can chop it down a little bit since it's about 1,200 pages in manuscript, and I would like I would love to cut like 100 pages of that or so but we shall see what we shall see when I get to the restart um, when I get it back with all the comments and things so that's what's going on what is going on tonight however is slightly different um, and that happens to be um, that I am going to be reading to you guys and I had a like a lot of thoughts about reading and for one thing I was going ah, do I really want to jump into another big long book the next few months are going to be really crazy um, you know I, I maybe if I could take things in smaller dosages but I've read most of the stories I had I am reluctant to start reading other people's fiction just because of, because of the issues of you know what's fair what's right do I have to contact people etc we're in the middle of a very uh, confusing, active, and fraught time around the old homestead, around the Beale Williams Honor Rancho, um, which makes it a little complicated. Um, by the way, all this hemming and hawing about all the things going on here, don't worry, there's nothing dramatically bad that anybody needs to know about. Deb and I and the family, we're, we're all fine. Everybody's okay. Um, we're just dealing with day-to-day -day life issues. Um, but as I said, nothing serious. I'm still working. And in fact, that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about. Because what you all are going to do over the next couple of few weeks, next few weeks, probably a couple of months actually, is you, whether you want to or not, are going to help me with my homework. And here's why. When I finish The Navigator's Children, um, this is according to the boss, who in this case is Deb. Uh, when I finish The Navigator's Children, the next order of business is that I have to write the last, or not write, I have to finish writing because Deb's already done a draft, but I have to finish off the last of the three ordinary farm books because it's been like 20 years since we started this series. And, um, you know, many excuses, many issues, many things that weren't our fault and other things that were and, you know, just life as she has lived um, has intervened several times along the journey. But uh, so I have to write the last Ordinary Farm book and uh, or I have to finish the last Ordinary Farm book. So what I'm going to do, um, I know I read the first Ordinary Farm book to you guys, but what I have not read to you is the second Ordinary Farm book. This is the British edition, right? Yeah, which was published by Quirkus. And uh, this is The Secrets of Ordinary Farm, which was originally titled A Witch at Ordinary Farm. I don't remember why we changed that, but we did. And uh, so I'm going to read that to you guys um, because I think it's a good book. And many of you have not probably read it uh, since it didn't get 
Um, I don't think it ever did get an American publication because, again, the, the weirdness of what happened with Ordinary Farm. I'm, I won't go into too much in the way of details, but it's been a very painful process um, for everybody involved uh, with the Ordinary Farm book. So anyway, I have to go back and finish up the, the draft of the third volume, which at this point is called The Heirs, H-E-I-R-S, Heirs of Ordinary Farm. Um, and because I have to do that, I have to reread the book anyway, and I just picked it up to start rereading it the other day. And so today, as I was thinking about what I was going to read tonight, I suddenly went, aha, I can kill two birds with one large rock. Um, and uh, my reading audience can help me out with my homework here so that I will be better prepared when the time comes in another couple of months to finish the Ordinary Farm series. Um, Deb's already put a lot of work into it. And so, uh, but it, it's, as with any story that I'm involved in, it's extremely complicated. And there's a lot of weird stuff, including time paradoxes and things like that. And since it's been, God, how many years since this book came out? Uh, 2012. So it's been 11 years since the last volume came out. So I'm damned if I remember most of the details. Um, e even though I, Deb and I worked on the, the first draft of the third book together, she did most of the work, but I did a lot of the plotting and planning. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do. So I hope that's okay with you guys. I'm not sure there's much I could do about it. If it wasn't, um, so, <laughs> so that's where we are. I'm going to just briefly see if I can jump down the list here and see who's checked in, um, and has left a comment. Um, again, I'm, I'm still using the same format that I was using last time. I have not had a chance again because of all the crazy stuff going on in, at our house. I have not had a chance to, um, start working with the uh, YouTube version or anything like that. So many apologies. I know that uh, Chris has tried to help me out and sent me a, a tutorial and all that, which I did look at, but I've just haven't had a chance. So life is like that sometimes. No, my life is always like that. Anyway, so let me just check in and say to uh, all the folks here that I have, and although I'm missing one, it looks like because it says, all these names, and then the bottom it says, and one more. Go figure. Anyway, so Jack Riggins, hello, good to see you. Voter Vandenberg, good to see you. Kristen, welcome back. A pleasure as always. Petra, to see you. Jeremy, hello, buddy. Good to see you. Ilva, my darling, nice to have you with us, as always. Sarah, hello, Sarah, good to see you. Suzanne, Iris, my God, it's the same old crew. How nice. Uh, Suzanne, Iris, Mahmoud, Anamika, Hazel, my mother-in-law. Hello, sweetie. Good to see you. I'm sorry I can't see your individual messages right now. I'm just reading names off the list of people who've commented. So much love. Uh, your daughter's fine. She's upstairs sleeping the sleep of the, the innocent and the just right now. Dirk, hello. Good to see you. Jerry. Mr. Unangst, a pleasure. Mark Redman, good to see you. Hope things are good in Yorkshire. Nicole, hello. Debbie, good to see you too. Penny, a pleasure as always. And Carol, nice to see you too. Is there any way to find out who the one more is? Or are they going to let me do that? Probably not. They're just going to be... Uh, anyway, it's too confusing. Um, but anyway, so we've got lots of comments. We've got lots of people. Um, that's all good. And as a result, I am going to start reading in just a moment. But I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should tell you about. Um, as you know, and as many of you in Europe have probably also experienced, and certainly a lot of people in the U.S. have experienced, we've had some crazy-ass weather in the last few weeks, um, terrible stuff just in the last few days, not in our part of the woods, but terrible tornadoes down, down south here in the States, and uh, even one down in Southern California, which is not tornado country. Um, we haven't had anything that bad, although we did have a long stretch of storm, uh, winds, trees down, etc. We lost power. We always lose power. Uh, we lost our cable connection for several days. We and, and the problem with where we live is there's no cell signal. 
So when you lose your power and the, the router goes down and you don't have, uh, and then after we even got the power back, the router was still down because it was a separate problem, also storm related. But at my house, when the power goes down, you got nothing. You got nothing. We've got, you know, the, we've got, we're on a well, you know, we live in the hills, so we're on a well. The well runs on electricity, of course, because there's a big pump to bring the water up out of the ground. So you got no water. <laughs> we have no phone because where we are on the hill, the hill blocks the cell service. So we got no cell service. Um, we got nothing else when the power goes off, obviously. We got no electricity. We got no... Uh, we've got only as much phone coverage, you know, for doing whatever we can do with a telephone like whatever with a cell phone which whatever stuff is on the phone that we can access like books or something um but there's no no internet connection and if you want to do anything including drop a message onto facebook or twitter or something to let people know that you're not dead um, or check in with text with other members of the family, you know, including my aging dad and other people who I like to stay in touch with and let them know that I am still alive. Um, have to get in the car and drive until one can get a cell signal and a decent enough cell signal to be able to actually do anything. So that's what it's been like during this time. And of course, we have large dog Johnny who loathes the rain, who hates the rain. Um, I cannot tell the way that Gollum feels about Bagginses, that's how Johnny feels about rain. He just anytime the rain starts, he hears it on the roof and he's staring and he's immediately over whacking me with his paw to let me know that the deadly rains have begun again and I need to do something about it. And tragically, <laughs> in these circumstances, I am always reminded of the first time I ever truly disappointed my children, which was when my very young at the time son, who is now a strapping young man of 26, when my young son approached me um, and uh, basically said, you know, I know, he's probably like four or five or something, that he had some game that he was playing, that he was having trouble getting past a certain point. And I had to confess to him, I had no idea how the game worked or what he needed to do next. And I mean, this was, we're talking a kid game, you know, kid computer game. So it was stuff like, how do I get the balloon to float over to the next country or something? You know, it was like really simple. This is not Gears of War or something. And, uh, you know, he was five. And I had to tell him, I don't know, honey. I don't know about that. And he looked at me and it was the most oh my God, the universe I live in is a hollow shell and my pride in my father is a grim joke and I thought he could do anything and he cannot, cannot even make the balloon fly in my game. So anyway, I mention this because the only other time I get that response because when my wife believes that I am being an idiot, her response or her, her way of getting this to me is a much more nuanced sort of way. <laughs> but my son could not be nuanced. He was just like, oh my God, my dad is an idiot. And um, Johnny, the dog, is much the same way. He will be smacking me with his paw and I'll have to tell him, you know, John, I can't do anything about it. It's just rain. And the look, the whale eye look that he gives me, like of just, why won't you help me? Why won't you do something about this terrible, terrible noise on the roof? And if I let him, he because he'll also, then he'll go and scratch to go outside. And I open the door and he sits there and he stares at the rain coming down like it might change if he looks at it. And of course it doesn't. And then every now and then when he has to, he'll go outside, get soaking wet. And if it catches him in the wrong frame of mind, he'll just disappear for an hour. He'll just go up the hill and go sit under a tree somewhere uh, on our property. But, but you know, just won't come back in. I don't know. Is he dug under the fence again? Has a, tr a tree come down in the storm and smashed the smash the fence so that he can get out again because that's always heartbreaking it just happened again on my birthday not a tree this time but he we had a washout on the part of the hill and there was a place under the 
fence so he made like you know like a big snake and went right under it and he was gone but he doesn't stay out as long as he used to anyway so needless to say we had the storm we had thunder we had wind we had lack loss of you know power and cable and everything and we had a panicked dog and then the other dog is not panicked he doesn't give a damn about any of that but he's epileptic and when he gets fitty as we say that also makes Johnny really nervous so that's another time that Johnny feels it's appropriate to come and smack me in the head with his paw in the middle of the night as I'm trying to sleep to let me know that Walter is acting weird, which, you know, everybody knows that in the household because he's, you know, even when he's not, he's on medication, so he doesn't go into full seizure. But he definitely behaves differently. He gets all hunched up and weird looking and, and, and he, he yelps if you try to touch him and all kinds of things, the poor guy. Little Chihuahua. So, I mean, he's, he's, you don't even see him half the time. He's under the covers. You get into bed and he lets out this horrid shriek because you touched him, you know, and stuff like that. And, that. and then Johnny will immediately leave the room and then come back in half an hour later and stare at you like, why, why would you do that? Why would you let that little dog make that noise and scare me? So anyway, it's been fun. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And meanwhile, through all of this, we're dealing with all kinds of other interesting issues. And uh, so that's my update. So, but at the moment, we're in a, in a nice trough of no rain for a few days. And uh, we've got various things we need to get into the house before the rain starts again, because they're sitting out in the driveway. So that'll be my job for tomorrow. And I think that's basically it in terms of bringing you up to date on anything of supreme significance. So... What I am going to do then is I am going to read from the aforementioned The Secrets of Ordinary Farm, which is the second book of the Ordinary Farm books. The first book was called The Dragons of Ordinary Farm. The third one is currently titled The Heirs of Ordinary Farm, but we'll see because it's not done yet and uh, what we're going to do in terms of the title. So I am going to begin, and we begin with the prologue. And the prologue has a title, and that title is Calling Him Like a Dog. Hurry! Make, mass, make faster magic, boy! Mr. Walkwell sounded grumpy, but that was no surprise. Mr. Walkwell didn't like Colin much, and made that clear to him nearly every day. The children will be here in a few hours, and Gideon wants everything to be ready. Colin Needle made a face but didn't say anything, only bent closer over his laptop. Thunder rumbled above the distant hills. The sky felt heavy, hot, and close. The children this, the children that. He was so sick of hearing about them. Everybody at Ordinary Farm, except Colin and his mother, seemed to think Lucinda and Tyler Jenkins were something wonderful, but really the two were nothing but troublemakers. <coughs> In just a few weeks last summer, the Jenkins kids had managed to ruin all of Colin's careful plans to improve Ordinary Farm. And now they were coming back for another summer's stay. Lucinda and Tyler, Tyler and Lucinda. He was tired of hearing their names and tired of everyone on the farm making such a big show out of their return visit. The sky growled again. A single fat drop of rain fell on Colin's screen. The weather had been strange all spring and didn't show any sign of changing. The days as hot as they always were at this time of the year, but also damp, overcast, and even sometimes stormy. Colin Needle had never been to a tropical country, but he imagined it might be a little like the weather around this part of California lately. Ragnar had finished installing the complicated new gate on the adobe barn and now he wandered over, wiping either sweat or rain off his forehead with his wide forearm. Why aren't you finished, Needle? The great Norseman demanded. We have done all the hard part, boy. Just cast your spades so we can go and get ourselves something cold to drink. It's not magic, and they're not spells, Colin said through clenched teeth. I'm trying to hook the new security gates and fences up to a computer network so we can do everything from a distance. I already explained it several times. 
you told me your flat box makes things work by invisible lightning that flies through the air, said Ragnar. What is that if it is not magic? Colin scowled. Nobody else at Ordinary Farm knew anything much about electricity or computers, let alone wireless networks. Most of them had been born centuries before such things existed. Even his mother, who had learned enough to use the internet and keep her experimental and household records on a computer, still could not come close to what Colin himself could do. Some day, Gideon would be gone, and Colin Needle would be in charge. Lucinda and Tyler Jenkins would have to do exactly what he said then, if he even allowed them to visit the farm. And his own mother, frightening as she might be, would also have to do what he wanted. A deep, rasping snarl from the far side of the barn made Colin Needle jump in fear. Ragnar laughed and slapped his thigh. He had made it very clear that he didn't like Colin any more than Mr. Walkwell did. Don't jump out of your skin, boy. It's just the mantis saying they are tired of their cage. They want to come out and play with you. Very funny, Colin said, but he was shivering. Those things are killers. And who made Gideon think so much about protecting the farm? Mr. Walkwell gestured to the sliding electric gate they were struggling to finish. Who was it who brought Gideon's enemies here, onto our land? Leave me alone, will you? I said I was sorry. I've said it a thousand times. In truth, Colin thought Gideon's new obsession with security was the most intelligent idea the old man had come up with in years. But that didn't make him want to spend any more time around these imprisoned monsters than he absolutely had to. There was something about their orange eyes, something so cold and knowing. You said their cage is secure, right? He asked the two men. Right? Then get out of the way and let me try this. Colin clicked the open button on his screen. A few yards away, the motor whined for a moment. Then the heavy metal barn gate rattled as it began to slide to one side on its small wheels. It really was a little bit like magic, Colin Needle thought proudly. The mantis heard the noise and began grunting and barking inside the barn. Colin was very grateful that the savage things were caged behind heavy steel bars. Their long, yellow teeth, clawed fingers, and curiously intelligent but emotionless eyes had haunted more than a few of his nightmares lately. A brief flurry of rain spotted the dust and splashed warmly on Colin's neck. He opened and closed the gates a few more times to make certain he had set everything correctly, then shut down the program while Ragnar and Mr. Walkwell finished with the last details. Simos Walkwell whistled to him, a sound that made Colin bristle, calling him like he was a dog. Needle, he said, take the end of this metal rope and hold it as I pull the rest up. Mr. Walkwell didn't seem to sweat even in the most sweltering weather, but he pulled off his hat and ran his fingers through his hair as he examined the loop of plastic-covered wire cable in his hands. He hadn't sanded down his horns in several days, and they looked like tiny tree stumps growing just above his temples. It's not a metal rope, said Colin. It's wire. The word is wire. The old Greek barked a humorless laugh. You know what I meant. Now make yourself useful, boy. Hold the metal rope and close your mouth. Both things will help. Colin swallowed a bitter response. You'll see, he thought. I really will be in charge of this farm one day, no matter what you or those stuck-up Jenkins kids think. And when that happens, everything's going to be different. Very, very different. The summer storm had already drifted off to the other side of the valley as its last damp traces vanished into the dirt. As the thunder died away, Colin could finally hear the sounds coming from the barn on the other side of the new gate, the restless noises of large, hungry creatures waiting to be released. 
Chapter 1, Cold War Farm. I can't believe you came to pick us up, Uncle Gideon. Fourteen-year-old Lucinda Jenkins turned to her younger brother. Isn't this great? We're back. For once, even Tyler wasn't trying to pretend he was too cool for anything. Yeah, he said, grinning. It's definitely great. It was amusing to see his sister so thrilled. This, from a girl who thought even Planetoid, the best video game in history, was lame. In fact, Tyler was feeling pretty happy himself. Even the unusually damp weather seemed exciting. Uncle Gideon looked happy to see them, too, which made a nice change from long stretches of last summer when he had acted as though he regretted inviting them to his very special farm. Gideon Goldring looked healthier than he had last year as well. He was even wearing something other than his normal working costume of pajamas and a bathrobe. His white hair was uncombed as usual, of course, but very clean, and his skin was tanned as though he had been spending time out in the sun. And it's good to have you two here, their great uncle said, laughing. Now hurry, children. We have a long drive ahead of us, and everyone's waiting to see you. Seamus Walkwell, Gideon's right-hand man, or at least with his hat and boots on, he looked like a man, although Tyler and his sister knew better, nodded and might even have smiled a little, but broad emotional displays were not his style. He tossed both big suitcases up onto the wagon wagon bed, as if they were no heavier than sofa cushions, then hopped up onto the driver's bench. Lucinda scrambled up into the bed of the cart, Tyler right behind her. Lucinda was so excited she couldn't stay quiet. Wow, it's great to be here. How is everybody? And how are the animals? How's the baby dragon? Your last letter said she's big now. Uncle Gideon's last letter had also been months ago. Lucinda had been driving her brother crazy since then. Is she all right? Gideon chuckled. Yes, child, yes, all the animals are fine. All the people, too. Mr. Walkwell swung back up onto the bench and clucked his tongue. Culpepper, the cart horse, snorted, then pulled the wagon into a broad turn across the main road. A few townsfolk on the opposite sidewalk looked up, and one or two even waved. It was clearly another slow Saturday in downtown Standard Valley. Gideon lowered his voice. You didn't tell anybody at home anything, did you? About the farm? No, Uncle Gideon, both children cried at the same time. And Tyler added, We wouldn't do that. We promised. Darn right. Gideon settled back on the bench. Because that is the first rule. In fact, that's almost the only rule I have. Not quite true, Tyler thought, amused. You got a few of them. Don't ask too many questions about the animals. Don't ask questions about the fault line, where the animals come from. Don't ask about what happened to your wife, Grace. And definitely don't ask why you have a witch for a housekeeper. But, of course, Tyler didn't say any of that. He had made it through an entire amazing, wonderful, incredibly dangerous summer at Ordinary Farm last year. And the one thing he had learned for certain was that when Gideon Goldring was in a good mood, it was better just to keep your mouth shut and enjoy it. And their great uncle really was in a good mood, as though he had missed the children almost as much as they had missed Ordinary Farm. Tyler hadn't spent his school year counting the seconds until they, they could return in quite the way his sister had, but he had definitely been looking forward to this. He had been worrying about it, too. So many secrets. So many crazy, dangerous secrets. And now it all starts again, he thought. Ten whole weeks. Anything could happen. Wow. We're really back. Lucinda stared down the sloping road to the valley floor. It was so hard to wait. Does it look the same? Asked Gideon. As you remember it. Better. When can I see the dragons? 
Tyler knew she was dying to talk to them, as she had found out she could do at the end of last summer. She had talked about little else all the way down on the train today. Can I stop in and see them now, Uncle Gideon? Before we go to the house? The reptile barn's just over there, and we're so close. Mr. Walkwell grunted in disapproval, but Gideon was still in a good mood. I suppose so, just for a minute. If you promise to stay out of trouble, I will, I will. Oh, thank you, Uncle Gideon. The old man was smiling. Just don't tell Mrs. Needle. She doesn't like me changing the schedule. She doesn't like anything with a pulse, Tyler said under his breath. But he knew that at this moment, Lucinda wouldn't have cared even if Patience Needle was riding toward them on a broom. After they had descended from the hill road, they crossed a wooden bridge over a creek, then followed the line of the new and impressively tall wire fence that ran around the outside of the property. Tyler also couldn't help noticing the signs reading, Danger! Electric Fence! Is it really electric? he asked. Not enough to kill anyone, said Gideon, just to keep unwanted visitors from climbing over. And if they try it some other way, well, he pointed to a small dome-shaped object on the top of a fence post. We've got cameras. They work at night, too, Gideon chortled. Much less work for Mr. Walkwell to guard the property now. Isn't that right, Simos? I didn't ask for this, Mr. Walkwell sounded unhappy. My ears and my nose are still better than any seeing box. Yes, but even you can't keep track of what's going on across the whole valley at the same time. Gideon seemed amused by the overseer's grumpiness. This will be good for you, Simos. You're not getting any younger. Pericles said that to me, too. Mr. Walkwell turned back to watching the road as it ran along beside the fence. They were approaching a large gate that was definitely another new addition. He never knew Pericles, said Gideon in a stage whisper. Pure exaggeration. Since Tyler didn't know the guy either, he could only shrug. So that's the new gate? One of them, yes. But why? Lucinda sounded alarmed, and Tyler couldn't entirely blame her. The hills and the valley hadn't changed at all, but here was something that definitely had. A ten-foot-tall gate of steel and heavy timbers. Tyler thought it looked like the entrance to a fortress or a prison. I told you in the letter I sent over the Christmas holidays, Gideon said. Told you we couldn't have you visit until now because we were making some changes. Well, this is one of them. We've got new fences and gates for the whole farm. In fact, we've got a whole new security system. Kind of weird, said Lucinda. It looks like, like East Berlin, said Tyler, who had just finished the Cold War in his American history class. Gideon shook his head emphatically. Happy mood now gone. Don't, don't be stupid. The Berlin Wall was meant to keep people in. I am protecting myself against people who want to creep onto my property and steal my secrets. Not the same at all, he glared at the children. Or oh, have you forgotten what happened last summer? Tyler decided it might be a good time to stop talking about the gate. No, Uncle Gideon. Of course not, Uncle Gideon, said Lucinda. We get it. Tyler looked along the fence, which stretched as far as he could see in either direction. It, uh, it looks very secure, Gideon laughed harshly. It had better. Do you know how much it cost to build fences and mount cameras around 10,000 acres? It took most of the money that Ed Stillman tried to use to bribe Simos, and that was quite a lot of dough. Except that money hadn't really been a bribe, Tyler knew. Billionaire Ed Stillman had brought it to purchase a dragon egg from Colin Needle, a crime against ordinary farm that Tyler and Lucinda had helped prevent, then also helped to hide from their great uncle. 
Now Gideon climbed down from the cart and punched some numbers into a keypad beside the fence. A lock clicked open and the heavy gate rolled to one side on little wheels. After they had driven through it, it slid closed again by itself. That's to make sure no one leaves it open by mistake, Gideon said. Wonderful improvement. And there are others you haven't seen yet. We're really set now. Just let Stillman's mob try to sneak in here without us knowing about it. Even Lucinda had finally fallen silent. As they turned toward the reptile barn, the tall shadow of the gate stretched a long way down the road in front of them. <coughs> Excuse me. As you may have noticed over the years, certain voices are tougher on me than others. <coughs> Chapter 2. A Flaming Loogie. As they pulled up in front of the barn, Lucinda thought she heard someone calling them. Mr. Walkwell must have heard it, too, because he turned to look off in the direction of the farmhouse. A strange object was approaching them, something odd and upright, trailing a cloud of dust. Oh, crud, said Tyler. Him. Colin Needle rode unevenly toward them across the dirt, jouncing up and down on the seat of a plain, old-fashioned black bicycle. Tyler laughed. Hey, nice ride, Needle. Is that your mom's bike? Oh, it's good to see you too, Jenkins, said Colin with a tight and completely unconvincing smile as he bumped to a halt beside them. Hi, Lucinda, he said to her. Welcome back to the farm. He sounded like he actually meant that part. Lucinda thought Colin was taller and thinner than the previous summer. He was also dressed in an old, ill-fitting coat and matching trousers. With his hair mussed by his riding, he looked like some kind of wheeled scarecrow. Hi, Colin, she said. You, you look nice in your suit. It wasn't entirely true, but Lucinda wanted to start the summer being friendly this time. She was convinced that Colin Needle wasn't all bad. Tyler snorted, but Colin and Lucinda both ignored him. Thanks. Colin quickly turned to Gideon as if he was embarrassed now to meet Lucinda's eye. My mother saw you heading over here, and she wanted me to remind you that Sarah's worked all day, making us all a hot meal, but it won't stay hot for long. Sauce! She must have been watching through my binoculars. Gideon turned to Tyler and Lucinda. Meaning we had best hurry up, I suppose. He sounded as pleased as a small boy to be bending the rules before patience loses her patience. Even Lucinda, on her best behavior, couldn't pretend that that was a great joke, but she chuckled as best she could. Come with me, Colin, she said. I'm just going in to see the dragons. Come along. I'll be quick. Colin, who was beginning to get off his bike, suddenly stopped. Um, no, thanks. You go on. I'll wait here. Don't be silly. You can tell me what you've been doing since last summer. Lucinda almost took his arm, but thought better of it. She wanted to be nicer to the tall, awkward boy this year, but she didn't want to give him any ideas. Come on. Colin reluctantly, very reluctantly, joined the small group as Mr. Walkwell pushed open the heavy door. The air was at least as hot inside the massive barn as it was outside, but it was also full of the musky smell of wild beasts. Lucinda did her best not to let the stink bother her. After all, this was what she had been waiting for. Sorry. Lucinda did her best to not let the stink bother her. After all, this was what she had been wanting for months, the way a little kid wants a special doll for Christmas. Hang on, just checking here. All right, good. We're in good shape. It looks like we're still rolling. Uh, so where was I? There we go. Meseret, the adult female dragon, lay stretched in her enclosure with her wings folded against her body, big as a city bus, beautiful and awful. 
Lucinda could not hold in an excited squeak at seeing her. Meseret was like something out of a children's storybook, all thick leathery scales and knobs and whorls of bone, something that should not exist in the real world. But there she was. The eyes with their slit pupils watched them all and gave away nothing. Can you hear me, Meseret? Lucinda did her best to speak with her thoughts. Do you remember me? We flew together. Although, to be perfectly fair, an observer on that night last summer might have thought Lucinda had been dangling helplessly from Meseret's harness. Do you remember me? I'm Lucinda. She had tried to convince herself not to expect too much at first, but Meseret's gigantic, uncaring silence pained her anyway. Remember? I helped save your egg. Man, look at this. The little one's here too, called Tyler, and Lucinda reluctantly turned away from the big dragon. You wrote in your Christmas letter that you named her Desta, she said to Gideon. Her great uncle nodded. It's an Ethiopian word for happiness. My wife Grace once had a puppy with that name. It was very dear to her. Desta didn't look much like a puppy, or in fact like a baby of any kind, at least compared to the tiny thing that had hatched in the farmhouse kitchen last summer. The young dragon was now as big as a small horse. In most ways, she was a smaller, more slender version of her mother, but her overall color was a sandy brown instead of drab gray-green, with rosettes of brick red and a frill of pale olive spines down her back. Desta's scales, some as big as Lucinda's hand, others as small as a sliver of her pinky nail, glinted and shone as the muscles moved beneath the skin. The young dragon was watching Lucinda and Tyler, too, but she mostly looked as if she wanted to go back to sleep. So cool, Tyler whispered. Is anything wrong with her? Lucinda asked staring at the straps around Desta's middle. A chain connected the arrangement to a large ring set into the concrete floor of the pen, close to the pile of straw she was using for bedding. What's that thing she's wearing? Harness, said Gideon. Have to keep it on her right now. She'll learn to fly soon, you see. Don't want her leaving the property by surprise. She must hate it. Don't sentimentalize the animals, her great uncle said. That's a mistake. Meseret grow suddenly growled, and although the mother dragon was some distance away from her, Lucinda could feel the slow, rumbling sound through her feet. Why'd she do that? Lucinda asked. Is she all right? Perfectly all right, said Gideon. She's probably just hungry. Meseret raised her vast head and swiveled it from side to side, nostrils flaring as if she smelled something. Gideon, said Colin, maybe we should, maybe we ought to. Lucinda couldn't help noticing that the older boy sounded genuinely frightened. I'll just. A strange loud noise made Lucinda jump, a wet pop, like a starter's pistol held underwater. Colin Needle jumped, shrieking in surprise and pain. Ah! Oh, help, it's hot! It's burning me! Lucinda spun to see Colin jumping and thrashing wildly. Something thick and sticky was running down his jacket, something that smoked. An instant later, Colin's jacket burst into flame. Luckily, Mr. Walkwell was only a few yards away. The wiry old Greek moved with such incredible speed that Lucinda had just opened her mouth to shout for help when he wrestled off Colin's burning jacket and threw it aside. He shoved the pale, whimpering boy onto the floor, then rolled him back and forth to make sure he was no longer on fire. For long moments after the flames were out, he kept Colin down on the ground. The black-haired boy lay trembling violently, his breath hitching. Is he all right? Lucinda asked. Colin, are you okay? It is not bad, said Mr. Walkwell. 
His mother will give him something for the burns. He didn't sound too worried. As Mr. Walkwell and Gideon helped the tall, pale boy out of the reptile barn, Tyler crept up next to Lucinda and quietly said, Well, I guess dragons don't forget that easily, huh? Desta's mom hasn't forgotten who stole her egg. Don't be mean, Tyler. What he had, what he had said finally sunk in. Wait a minute. You mean Meseret? Was that her? What did she do? I guess she still remembers Colin from last summer. She spat at him from 20 feet away, hawked a big one. He rubbed his mouth to hide his grin. A flaming loogie. Thunder rumbled softly in the distance. The storm seemed to be moving away. Lucinda was not amused. In fact, she felt a bit sick inside, all this from trying to be friendly. Poor Colin. He didn't want to go near the dragons, but I made him do it. He's fine, Luce. Anyway, he deserved it. Just ask Mama Dragon. But this was most definitely not the way Lucinda had wanted to start the summer. <coughs> ah. All right, good. Let's check and make sure everything is still running. Of course, no, 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 no comments. No, nothing to be seen here. Okay. Got a few more people who've showed up, so that's good. Um, anyway, so back we go. Again, and I'm out of focus. Come back. Come back to Tad. Come back to Tad. No, we're not going to come back to Tad. Oh, well. Chapter 3. Into Mount Zion. The side trip to the reptile barn had led them to a different route had led them a different route from the one they usually took back from town. Tyler found it interestingly strange to approach through the center of the farm, past outbuildings and barns, instead of seeing it across a distance from the road in the hills. From the hillside, the buildings came into view below like a fleet of strange painted wooden spaceships, all red and yellow and tan and white. But their approach this time made the house and its connected structures rise up before them like a vast sea of sawtoothed roofs and towers, an entire toy city made by drunken Christmas elves and plunked down in the middle of a dusty California valley. Look, Luce. His sister looked up. Oh, yeah, she said. We're definitely back. She had been trying to comfort Colin, who was huddled near them in the back of the wagon, eyes red and jaw clenched. Tyler didn't think the older boy's injuries were as bad as he was making them out to be. Lucinda gave him a warning look as the cart horse pulled them past the old grain silo. The tall gray structure looked like a haunted house out of a scary movie, but was actually only an empty wooden building that covered the farm's greatest secret, the fault line, a gateway to other times and places discovered by Octavio Tinker. Tyler didn't know what Lucinda's look meant and didn't much care. She had her dragons, and he had the fault line. In fact, as far as Tyler knew, he was the only person in the world who could walk into it and out again safely without the help of any machine or device. Did she really think he was going to ignore it all summer? A crowd of people was, push was pushing through the front door of the farmhouse and out onto the covered porch, a group of smiling, familiar faces waiting to greet them. Even before the wagon rolled to a stop, the farm folk were hurrying toward them. "'You are here! That is good, very good!' cried Sarah, the cook, as she wiped her hands on her apron, her ruddy cheeks even ruddier than usual because she had been cooking. Tyler took his hug from her with good nature, although... She nearly squeezed the breath out of him. Sarah was short but strong. She was also serious about hugging. A moment later, she had captured his sister, too, and squeezed her until she squeaked. Sarah's kind spirit filled the house and was responsible for much of what was homey and welcoming about strange old ordinary farm. Pema, a quiet young woman from long ago Tibet, 
and her near opposite, Azinza, from Africa, tall, dark, and regal, followed closely after Sarah with hugs of their own. We missed you, Azinza told Lucinda. It was too quiet here after you went away. But not so quiet today, it seems. Sarah had seen Gideon lead Colin past them and into the house. What happened to him? But before Lucinda could answer, most of the rest of Ordinary Farm's inhabitants were upon them. Ragnar the Viking, a blonde bearded grandfather built like a professional wrestler, came at them with a big grin and surprised Tyler by pulling him into a rib cracking embrace. Kiwa, Jeg, and Hoka, the Mongolian herders whom the Jenkins kids had named the Three Amigos, hovered smiling, holding gifts they had made, a bracelet for each of the children woven from long strands of hair. Horse hair? Lucinda asked. Not horse, said Kiwa, the oldest. Unicorn, from tails and manes. They'd live on fence and bushes. Wow, said Tyler. With Jeg's help, he tied his onto his wrist. The braided hair was surprisingly thick and heavy, shiny as platinum wire. That's so cool, said Lucinda, examining hers. Thank you. The last person to come forward was Ula, the girl Tyler had rescued from the Ice Age, cleaned up and wearing a dress, but with long, curly brown hair that looked as if it hadn't caught up with modern brushing techniques. Ula took Tyler's hand and pressed it carefully to her forehead. Tyler smiled at her, but he wasn't quite sure what the gesture meant. It is good to see you she said, looking at him shyly through surprisingly long lashes. She then seemed to remember something else she had to do, and scuttled back into the kitchen, leaving Tyler a bit confused. Of course, a huge celebration banquet had been prepared to welcome them back. Eine Feier, as Sarah named it. And soon the children were led to the table. Tyler decided it was entirely reasonable and polite to honor the work the cooks had done, by dedicating himself completely to food for the rest of the day. As he walked along the table where the dinner had been set out, he found roast chickens, juicy inside their crispy skins, enchilada casserole with homemade corn tortillas, several kinds of salads, and great big bowls filled with grilled artichokes and summer beans. Sarah had also prepared a specialty dish called sauerbraten, a sort of beef roast with fruit and cabbage. Tyler approached that one cautiously, but after a few sample bites, he went back and helped himself to a huge serving. Something, something about Ordinary Farm made him hungrier than he almost ever was at home. Later, as evening turned to night, Sarah brought out beer for the adults and a pitcher of strawberry lemonade for the others, then settled her wide, warm self between Tyler and Lucinda. How you two have grown, the mistress of the kitchen looked Lucinda up and down. So big now. Woman very soon. Yes, indeed, Lucinda blushed. And you, Tyler, you are much bigger. Tyler laughed. I've got a while to go before I catch up with Ragnar. Sarah nodded. Yes, poor Ragnar. He works so hard on all Gideon's fences and gates. She shrugged. What do you think about all that? Tyler asked. All the new fences and security. Oh, me. I don't know anything. Sarah clearly didn't feel comfortable talking about it. If Gideon says we need, then we need. He works so hard to keep us safe here. And he is still so sad his wife is gone. Poor man said Lucinda. Gideon's wife, Grace, had disappeared decades ago, but the mystery was still unsolved. He must miss her so much. But you help him, Tyler. Pema, the little Tibetan woman, had come up quietly. She blushed when everyone turned to her, but bravely continued. I mean, when you find his wife's necklace last summer, he always carries it, always around his neck. When he's sad, he reaches up and... She stroked an invisible something at her throat. Like so, 
makes him not so sad. She pointed. Look, she said, he is doing it now. Tyler turned to look at Gideon some distance away. He was indeed striking, stroking the locket's gold chain at his neck, but that wasn't what caught Tyler's attention. His great uncle was speaking to Mrs. Needle the first time Tyler had seen her since their arrival. The witch, to him she would always be the witch, was dressed in her usual prim, timeless way, long dark skirt and white blouse buttoned right up to her slim throat. She seemed to feel Tyler's gaze because she suddenly looked up. For a moment he saw what he felt certain was icy hatred in her eyes, but then it vanished like a mist, and she smiled at him in a way that appeared almost natural. Welcome back, she called. Tyler turned away, his stomach clenching. Lucinda gave him a warning look. And how is our Mrs. Needle these days? He asked Sarah. The cook made sure the Englishwoman wasn't looking before she scowled. She is what she is. Like almost everyone at Ordinary Farm, Sarah was a refugee from the past, a medieval woman with very, very firm ideas about witches. But she holds Gideon's ear, and he trusts her. Please do not make her angry. Why would we want to make her angry? Sarah shook her head. Just be careful, children. Please. She doesn't like you, and she is a bad enemy to have. Evening had fallen. Bats were swooping over the garden, snatching up moths and mosquitoes. Country hours ruled ordinary farm. Those who had not left to take care of after-dinner chores were beginning to drift toward bed. Gideon had retired half an hour, half an hour earlier. Caesar, the old black man who did handyman work around the house and insisted on taking, taking personal care of Gideon Goldring, suddenly began to sing a song, his cracked voice full of longing for something Tyler couldn't quite understand. Oh, let me fly now, let me fly. Let me fly into Mount Zion, Lord, Lord. The song was exactly right for the mood, or perhaps it was how Caesar sang it. Even Mr. Walkwell tapped a hoof. Ula, the Ice Age girl, stood in the middle of the floor, swaying and twisting her fingers in her thick brown hair. I just won't get up in the promised land. A hard hand fell onto Tyler's shoulder. He jumped in surprise. Good evening, children, said Patience Needle. Lovely to have you with us again. Now it's time for me to show you to your rooms. How's Colin? asked Lucinda. Are his burns okay? The woman's expression did not change. He is nearly well already. Burns are easy for me to heal. Now, come with me. Let me see how much I've got. I've got a few pages left, so I think I am going to stop there and finish this chapter off tomorrow night along with some more chapters because <coughs> my voice is going and i'm out of i've out i'm out of conditioning for reading so let me just check here see if there's anything i need to know really is that all the comments why are they doing this to me as always they're doing this to me Anyway, um, well, doesn't matter. So, uh, excuse me, that's where I'm going to stop for tonight. It's good to have you all back. It's good to see you. Um, I missed hanging out with you all. I uh, hope that you feel the same, or at least that you can fake it well enough that it'll keep me from feeling too bad. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. So, again, thank you for your presence. Be well, take good care of yourselves, take good care of friends and relations, and of course your loved ones. And I will see you, well, I'll be here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. my time to read some more for those who want to catch that. And failing that, of course, if you want to hear it, um, all of these things are currently being uh, put up on YouTube by Chris Fab, or else you can find them on 
my social media, at least on my Facebook pages. So with that, again, good night, farewell, see you very soon, maybe as soon as tomorrow, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you again. Peace and good night.